You're listening to Design Between the Lines, the only design and home furnishings podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry. It's here that I get a chance to sit and chat with the influencers shaping the industry into what it is today and to learn a little bit more about life in their world. As a creative strategist and engine that has delivered over 40,000 individual successful home furnishings products and licensing programs during a career spanning over three decades, Jenna Hall has become the go-to designer for the most innovative, relevant, and successful programs in today's marketplace. During her career, Jenna is one of only four women inducted into the American Furniture Hall of Fame, the founder of With It, the winner of five Pinnacle Awards, and the City of Hope's Spirit of Life Award. If anyone has spirit as much as talent, it's Jenna Hall. Jenna, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to start by rolling the calendar way back okay, and ask you, what was Jenna like as a child? Well, many people, most people think of me as a New Yorker, and I have lived in New York my entire adult life. But I'm a Texan. I'm five generations cowboy. My family uh, goes all the way back. They were merchants in Texas just after the Civil War. Were you as creative then as, as you are today? Did that develop over time? Uh, they, they actually uh, discouraged the creativity from a professional point of view because mm. they said you'd never make a living as an artist. But, and I wanted to be a fine artist, and I loved to paint. So I started in commercial art first and rapidly found out I hated drawing Coca-Cola bottles. It was boring. (laughs) And I loved architecture from my earliest years. So I switched. I went to a male-dominated school that did have a school of engineering and architecture and started in architecture and gravitated towards space planning, actually, time and motion efficiency in the early days of that. So that's my background educationally. But the, in Texas, they called me bohemian. I didn't know what the word was. My mother just said I was, didn't quite fit in the cowboy route. Yeah. So you have a mindset for what makes sense for what people do with their, in their li- daily exactly. lives. Exactly. And that foundation educationally really led me into, I did some really interesting projects in the first part of my career. I had married, um, my husband was uh, a pioneer in pediatric dentistry Mm -hmm. so time and motion efficiency with the small children was important and I started specializing in medical and dental offices uh, which for some odd reason someone approached me about kitchen design and I said kitchen design hmm so this is kind of a, how you transitioned into in, into home furnishings, maybe in in the early days. It, I backed into it by accident. So was it you weren't finding what you you needed or what you thought answered a question you were trying to answer for the customer? Or That's a perfect question. Um, at that time, the what we now call the contract market, mm-hmm. where you could buy hotel furniture and things like hospitality, was in its infancy in America. European markets uh, were not even part of the American knowledge base. Mm. And I came to High Point, the first time I came to High Point, they wouldn't even let me in the door because they said, what, you're a design? What, And you're gonna, what, what are you doing here? And there's nothing here, you're not a stocking furniture dealer. Oh, yeah. Of course, that's all changed. I ended up going to Europe, and when I did, I first went to the Milano show, and then I went to Copenhagen, I went to that market, and I ultimately ended up at the Messe in Cologne, Germany. Uh. And when I went to Cologne, the year I went was the International Kitchen and Bath Show that was shown simultaneously with the furniture show. There, I absolutely, my jaw dropped because that's where I found really the function, great function that we did not have in the American market, concealed hinges, any of the things we take for granted today, ex- fully extended drawer glides, hidden storage, all those things were already in the European market because after World War II, Mm -hmm. all those factories were developed from scratch to rebuild Europe. You made a lot of contacts in Europe at that time. I'm sure people that you still know today, some that uh, were any of these or any other folks in the U.S. as you developed your your background, uh, did they become mentors? Were they mentors of yours? And and who might they be? It's it's a great question. 
accidentally, you know, after uh, I was in the European market, we, we brought the first um, European kitchens to the American market for some luxury uh, real estate we were developing mm -hmm. and brought in containers, which meant I needed someone in America on this end to receive the containers and install them mm -hmm. because it was such new technology at the time. And that introduced me to, uh, I don't know if you know Werner Peel. Do you know Werner yes, Peel? Yes, I do know Werner Peel. Werner yeah. Peel had a partner, Werner Meyer. And oh. they had a showroom to the trade at that time, very high end, all imports from Europe. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, we would, we would work with you to bring it in. And not only did I work with them, I ended up designing with them for a number of years. And my, they were really my first product that I ever introduced into the market was with Werner Peel and Werner Meyer. And we entered, we did some things out of Spain, mm -hmm. uh, some pieces out of Italy. What were the company? Do you remember the company names? Well, it, some, yeah, it's a I good know, question. Warner's with Planum now. I, yeah, I well, Planum, it Planum, says, it was, um, Planum was the German company. It was mm -hmm. an offshoot of that uh, for the kitchens. Mm -hmm. But um, there was a company out of Spain by the name of Martex at the time. Oh, I've heard of that name, yeah. Uh -huh. Very well known. And they used yeah. to have a design competition in New York many, many years ago called the Roscoe Awards. They were international competition. Mm -hmm. And we entered, I entered two or three pieces made in Italy for them in that competition. And it won. It was an international competition. And I thought, hmm, this is fun. I like furniture. You yeah. know, this is a lot easier than building houses. Oh, that's for but sure. But I wasn't really serious at that time. It was kind of an offshoot. Well, I've got a question. I'm going to go back to the mentor sure. for a second. Were there any people, or it may not be just mentors, it could be someone who you may have wanted to model yourself after or someone you admired that you thought about how they thought about things. And you said, you know, I can, I can apply some of this to what I'm doing. Was there anyone like that in your, in your early days? Yes, there was. Uh, there was a gentleman who owned a outdoor iron company mm -hmm. and I really can't even remember how we met, but we met. Um, and he said, you know, we make iron furniture, and that's a, that's a man's business. You know, it's <laughs> welding, and it's kind of, it's metal. Mm -hmm. And he said, I think we could use color. And I don't, uh, he said, I'm colorblind. Would, can I hire you to talk to my board about color and women and color? And that's, he, he was a great visionary and very modest, and he actually did become my mentor for a lot of years. That was, his name was Larry Shaw. Mm. Well, here's here's somebody Lion who was Shaw. important to you, mm -hmm. Line Shaw, mm -hmm. an amazing person, and someone who recognized talent when he saw it. And, yeah. uh, that's a great thing. When Jenna Hall was young, she got her first taste for the industry when she started going to High Point Markets with her dad. And since she returned to market later in her professional career, I was interested to see how she perceived being received as a woman in the industry. You did not see women in the marketplace unless they were married to the retail buyers. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and occasionally a beautiful receptionist who would be at the front door of a showroom. That's how it used to be. Mm. The majority of the women at that time, the majority of the women working in the industry, if they were lucky, they would be recognized that they could pick fabrics. Uh. Okay. So there was a lot of that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the majority of the market evolved to the southern part of the United States, you still had some up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Indiana, and Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, uh, upstate New York. But the southern manufacturers, the women definitely uh, were uh, usually left at the factory. Well, did you ever have to pull out your car cowgirl in any particular situation? I think my Texas accent, I mean, most of it's gone today. <laughs> I'm living in New York all this time. Yeah, when I come yeah. back to North Carolina, I slide right back into something Thanks. that's non-New York. And ah. so people, and I, I, I knew how to curtsy when I had to. Ah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, that, now that brings me to talking a little bit about your creative process and work ethic and What's it like when you're designing? I mean, is there a, do you have a clear path? Does, does it come very to you very differently each time you have a project? Or I, It's it's a great question. I think the merchant uh, DNA that hmm. I have from my family uh, definitely comes through. I'm, and the architectural background and, and both sides, it's the practicality rather than 
wouldn't it be nice to design a fanciful piece of furniture? Yeah. Uh, I am very, very in tune and aware that there's a bottom line. Uh. There's an agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a targeted market. So all those things like marketing and merchandising come into play when I do come up with a new idea. Yeah. You have to be able to get it to the consumer in most cases by going through a retailer. Now with the internet, there's more and more of that. But the consumer has to respond to it. And we did a lot of market research in the early years. We know that uh, the decision makers in the home, when we're talking about couples, very often are women. Yet the early product was always really designed by men targeting the male market. It Hmm. didn't make sense. So um, I think it's a collaborative effort between men and women, uh, both in the manufacturing side of it and the marketing side of it. But it is with um, practicality, understanding who the customer is. Then you come to a new idea. It's by looking at voids in the market. When you're starting a project, you're beginning and you're thinking about you know what you've kind of isolated what it needs to be where do you where's your go-to for inspiration i mean do you have is it different every time or do you have something you like to start with uh, well that's that's um that's great i have an extensive library hmm. uh and even though everybody's on e-reelers today <laughs> i like i like the hard books the old beautiful the older the better mm-hmm. you know i i have a wonderful collection That's really for inspiration and knowledge rather than it is to copy. Uh We get inspiration from a lot of places. The everyday culture, the common culture, is really important. Movie sets and television sets really do influence the consumer. And watching the TV set designers, I mean, take mid-century, for example. Uh I mean, before Mad Men uh, became so hot, Mm-hmm. Uh, mid-century was really something that only a handful of collectors and high-end interior designers were doing. Yeah. Once it hit the the small screen, the TV screen, mm-hmm. plus a few movies, mid-century retro today is quite commonplace. Is there something that, that you can possibly tell our listeners about one of the popular collections that you've developed over the years that uh, kind of connect the dots with something that maybe you found like that? Here's a good example. Okay. In my uh, studio, mm-hmm. um, while we were still doing a lot of interiors and architectural work, but it was one of my first big, big furniture collections licensed under my name. Mm-hmm. But I was looking for inspiration uh, from the old countries. Uh, I had been to Europe, and I was very taken with styles of furniture that I had never really seen in the American market before Mm -hmm. and wanted to bring some of that into the collection. All right. In the meantime, on my bulletin board, I would periodically see something, an art magazine, a fashion magazine, something, travel magazine, clip it and stick it on the bulletin board like I'm sure you have in the Mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those things can sit there for two, three, four, five years. You just like them. You don't know what you're going to use them for. (laughs) And while I'm sitting there daydreaming about this collection, it was a painting by Andrew Wyeth, Ah. the great artist, American Mm. artist, of inside a lighthouse. And in that lighthouse, in the painting, Mm -hmm were three captain chairs, colonial captain chairs, Mm -hmm. and a table. The reason I liked it, I had never seen anything like it before. None of the captain chairs exactly matched, so I already realized that this man must have collected an assortment of chairs. Mm -hmm. One of the chairs, the top back rail was stained wood, and the rest of the chair had been kind of haphazardly painted white. The table base was unusual because it had a shelf underneath it with a round top, Mm -hmm. but the tabletop was stained. It wasn't white. And I kept staring at that for three or four years, and I thought, why? Why? I've never seen furniture like that before. (laughs) And it occurred to me he probably put the pieces together and made do. And I kept staring at it. Well, when I went to do the collection, I brought to the manufacturer captain tables and chairs for a great room we were designing. Mm -hmm. 
We coined that word great room, by the way, when we were doing all our land development. I was about to ask you that. Was, yeah. yeah. It's just, and took the walls out to make the space look bigger. And they said, well, they've never saw a room like this. Where's the dining room? It's there in one. It's a great room. And in that uh, originality from that came some great room furniture where I put this in my first collection. Anyway, so when it came time to make the prototypes, the manufacturer told me, this can't be done. The guys in the plant said it can't be done. Well, what they must have been saying is that crazy interior designer had a harebrained idea <laughs> because it had a wood top and a painted base. Yeah. And I asked a simple question, why can't it be done? Well, it won't go through the finishing line. It's either going to be painted white or it's going to be stained. Mm -hmm. So I said, why can't you put the bases through the paint line and the tops through a wood line? Oh, they said. Oh, uh, yes, yes. And that became a standard in the industry. That and the phrase you created, that's that's uh, quite something, to the great room. And boy, everybody uses that now, so uh, that's we, wonderful. We did a few of those, but that goes back to the marketing. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Now, that brings us to the, we talked about designer licensing programs and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And you really kind of, you really kind of set the stage for that with what you've done. Uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about how that how did that come about and, and uh, how has it grown from there? The way it came about uh, was one of the companies that I was working for was toying with the idea of um, doing a design line separate his company from everybody else. Okay. Meantime, in the apparel industry, the apparel industry had brands like Aero Shirt and Ship and Door blouses, Ship and Shore blouses. Mm -hmm. And they did the first licensing, as some people know, and they started putting names like Gloria Vanderbilt mm -hmm. yeah. on or Ralph Lauren and putting designer labels on brand products. And they became designer products with higher margins. Uh. And so they took the designer's signature patterns mm -hmm. to the bedding industry. I know this because I was asked to look at licensing for a manufacturer. And I really went into the background mm -hmm. and realized that there was a real opportunity to put a cross-merchandised collection together at retail with a decorator look at an affordable retail price point. Nobody had done it. The apparel people were starting to do coordinated products like right. if you did bedding you had lamps or you had rugs mm -hmm. but that was about as far as it went what if we did furniture as the driver and then did the textiles to go with it and the rugs and the sheets and pull the whole thing pull the it. thing together so it looked like a decorator had done the house mm -hmm. but within the safe parameters of all the colors that would coordinate and all the styles would go together not matched but mm -hmm. mixed so we coined mix and match as a term. Nobody was doing that. Nobody was doing designers for furniture. So we did the first designer line. And I had 20, I think 22 licenses for over 25 years. Which brings me to something I saw last October that you were involved in. Um, you, you rolled out a major, major, I don't know if there's, you can say major collection, but, but in, in terms of this the work that was involved in this Thomasville, I, I, you have to say major twice or maybe four times. I don't know how you say it or what you call it. Thanks, it John. Was, I need that sympathy. How about, a, how about a huge would be good? It was a huge collection, a major undertaking for you. I'm sure it took you months and months, maybe even years. But here's here's my thought. I'm looking at this thing. And, and you and I were on the phone, and I'm standing in the showroom, and you're uh, at another meeting, and I go, guess what I'm looking at? And, and, and I said to you, I said, what do you think this does f for Thomasville? And, you know, we talked about it. Thomasville's a major manufacturer, and they've done some wonderful collections over the years that, that elevated them every time they brought them out. I go back to... Uh, you know, something like Ernest Hemingway or, or Bogart, or Bogart. Uh, and in it, it just elevated the company. It it put him into another gear, and things moved forward and, and in a Thomasville way. And to me, when I looked at that collection, it said Thomasville all over it. I mean, it was like them speaking the language that they originally spoke in. Thank you. Once again, thank is you. that where you were headed? 
It's exactly what the challenge was because the company, like many companies, morph and change and goes through different ownerships, and they had drifted. It's not a, a secret. Many companies have. Yes. And I was fortunate enough, uh, one of the Thomasville, original Thomasville dealers was a client of mine. I had done his retail stores in the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area hmm. and learned very quick. And he carried other brands besides Thomasville. And I learned very quickly just how much it had eroded and got to really know him uh, and his merchandising needs, what made him want to be a Thomasville dealer in the first place. Mm -hmm. And he was very candid and told me where he felt they drifted away. Mm -hmm. And after a few months, I said, you know, I think what they need is such and such or such and such or such and such. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. He said it is, and and uh, so he made the introduction for me to discuss it with the company. Mm -hmm. So I really was designing to the old Thomasville dealer, but in a new verb, a new adjective, a new attitude. Every part of this collection that you did for Thomasville was had a story, and every piece had a story, which is amazing. I'm so glad you remembered. Yeah. The uh, We did title the collection Elements and Origins. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was uh, touch on uh, pieces that people could relate to emotionally. It sounds a little corny, but it's that's what drives a purchase. You know, they have to relate to it. They have to like it. If they don't, if they're they walking. If they don't, they're gone. <laughs> and the story behind it is important. Yeah. Because, and so what I did was base this first collection not only on the styles that Thomasville would re be representing well, but also the heritage here in America, that short of the Native Americans, everybody else came from somewhere. Right. Their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-grandparents, and that somewhere stuck in an attic or in a back room, there's heritage or a piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. And what's the story behind it? So most of the pieces in the collection were either based on um, the British heritage, which is a large segment in the American market, mm -hmm. but that would be the Cotswolds of England, Irish pubs, Celtic design, yeah. or Scottish. The mm -hmm. second part of the collection was um, based on the Scandinavian heritage, also very early in the 13 original colonies, mm -hmm. and but in a new fresh verb, a new way of looking at old Swedish furniture and Norwegian furniture, which mm -hmm. I just gotten back from a field trip in Norway and Sweden and hence again bringing the trip into right. what mm -hmm. stuck in your mind yeah and then finally uh, Paris yeah. more romantic you more, save that for the end because uh, probably that's your favorite place to visit maybe other now my favorite place I think in another life I must have been Italian ah <laughs> excellent well I'm with you on that that's one of my favorite places yeah. I couldn't sit down with legendary Jenna Hall without asking her about founding with it which is an acronym for Women in the Home Industry Today. It really was an outgrowth of a survival instinct. And uh, I was not an activist uh, in terms of the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. I was just looking for some female companionship along with the men that I had met. I met a lot of men, mm -hmm. very few women. And frankly, I wanted some advice. Uh, who should I go talk to and that kind of thing. Little by little, I met some women. But we really, there was a club, but I wasn't a member of the club, literally a club called the String and Splinter. Ah, yes. I could go as a guest of a man. Oh, uh, yes, I remember the rule. So one day I asked my friend who was taking me as a guest, I said, how do you, how do you get to be a member? I mean, I, I would love to be able to come sometime and reciprocate and buy you dinner. And he said, well, you got to be sponsored. And it was Bob McKinnon. Yep. Oh, and is that? Okay. It was Bob McKinnon yeah. and it was Jim Druckmann. Ah. Those two men sponsored me. And uh, th once I was a member, I said to Barbara, the club had private rooms that you could yes. reserve for dinner during market. Mm -hmm. By then I had a half a dozen or so women friends. I said, Barbara, could I reserve a room one night and invite all my lady friends? Well, she was giddy. She said, this will turn this place upside down. <laughs> Absolutely, let's do that. Kimberly Ray was uh, an editor yes. from New York at the time. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, Jenna, I think you're onto something. She said, 
why don't you invite, and she starts naming a bunch of ladies I didn't know. I said, are they here at market? Where are they hiding? (laughs) She said, let's have a party, and I'll get my paper to sponsor the party. We had about 300 women. Wow. I said, 300 women? Where'd they come from? I mean, they were either interior designers trying to buy direct. They were working on a, at the factory, something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was introduced to a number of people, including Peggy Traub, mm-hmm. who was the daughter of Marvin Traub from Bloomingdale's, yeah. and she yeah. had a company called Adesso. All three of us were from New York. We decided to meet back in New York in a subway <laughs> coffee <laughs> shop. And in about 15 minutes, we sat down and wrote a mission statement. Uh, called up my friend Connie Post, who did graphic design. Yeah, She did our logo for us. And then I said, wait a minute. How are we going to do this? As What are we trying to do? And what are we going to call it? Well, Kim was the best wordsmith in the world. Yes. She said, give me a day and I'll catch you a name. The mission was to encourage more women into the industry, mm-hmm. to educate more women in the industry, to perhaps even provide scholarships for more women in the industry, to mentor more women in the industry so that we could really truly service the full uh, community of consumers, both men and women, from a woman's perspective. It was not a feminist issue. It was just trying to bring more professional women into the industry and help educate them and network them. And the, and the so, industry needed it. Then we realized that we had to incorporate as a nonprofit, and how were we going to fund it? And how were we going to run it? Who was going to run it? Mm-hmm. And then we'd have to have a board and so on and so forth. And we sat down. And so I wrote up an agenda and invited a few of the lady friends who were all really on board with it. And we had a retreat after uh, market. Very good. Mm-hmm. I went to the big trade paper at the time mm-hmm. who was having a major conference with about 500 manufacturers and retailers attending. And I told him what we had in mind. And he invited me to speak at the conference. Uh. And I had two shills in the audience. (laughs) One was Connie Post and one was Judy George. Wow. Judy had retail stores up in Boston. Two major league. Two major players. Connie was doing furniture uh, store design, retail store design for Mm -hmm. some of the biggest retailers. Mm -hmm. They had their clients in in the audience. So Lester Kraft, the editor at that time, Furniture Today, invited me up and asked... Uh, if uh, he could have the attention that Jenna Hall had something to share with everybody. And Mm -hmm. I spoke about market research and the targeted market and how few women there really were in the industry, and we were going to try and fix that. And all we needed was some seed money to start the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And so Connie hits the elbow of, I think, Jordan's Furniture, who put their (laughs) hand up. How much money do you need? I said, well, we're looking for founding sponsors. And I said, we'd really like $1,000 a sponsor. We raised $75,000, and we launched with it. And we give out scholarship money every year today. And I'm happy to say that in 2017, uh, we will start our next 20 years. Congratulations. So we're 20 years old this year. Well, congratulations on that. And all the awards you've had over the years. Tell me your feeling about the future of, of direction of this industry and based on what you've just talked about with with it and women coming into the industry really more strongly than ever before and, and rightly so and, and major decision makers etc where do you think the industry is headed what's well i think the industry is coming through a, a huge period of consolidation first the uh you know the impact of imports mm-hmm. but besides that the consolidation itself but the job opportunities are there and there's a diversity of uh, opportunities that uh, for men and women coming into the industry uh, that i think we never dreamed of before because the integration now is so much more important in terms of visual merchandising media merchandising, the internet and the impact of the internet and how that is going to uh, communicate to the consumer in a new way. 3D design is changing radically the design part of the industry where there's going to be a almost the reverse of mass customization. It's going to be 
individual customization like we've never even anticipated. I'm seeing this, uh, in, in, and I know you speak to colleges around, and I've speak, spoken to some universities, both the design students, industrial design, whatever. But I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the regeneration or rebirth of maker designers, uh, men and women that, that actually make a product, and uh, through the internet, where you don't have a lot of need a lot of seed money to roll that out, they roll out the product and start to sell it online. Are you seeing that coming along? I am. I also think that, of course, uh, there's the liability issues. Correct. Uh, mm-hmm. That uh, not to um, detour, detour. Right. Um, or but to be aware that there is such a thing as liability when it comes to furniture design Mm -hmm. and um, flammability and environmental impact and all the other other things things, with the laundry of things that you don't think of when you just fall in love with a piece of furniture or or anything for that matter. Um, I think that the entrepreneurial spirit is appropriate. And I would encourage anybody who's really, really, really interested in bypassing the the corporate world to do their own thing to consider several things that if they want to do something in an entrepreneurial way they have to have a mentor they have to make sure they have some funding and Mm -hmm. some grounding well and i think you made a great point also uh, about knowing the standards uh, in whatever if home furnishings product you're developing knowing the standards that you need to meet for that product to and design to those standards That's right. so that it uh, can be sold in this country. That's right. Uh, I, I appreciate that very well. And I'm hoping our young listeners are, are aware of that and, and uh, ask away. If you're in college and listening to this program, make sure you get with your instructors and your, your uh, mentors there and ask lots of questions. Right, exactly. Well, I'm going to ask you... One final thing. Uh, First of all, I'm going to thank you for being with us here today on the show. Uh, It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I'm in awe of what Uh, you've done in this industry, and and, uh, and, uh, more power to you. Keep it going. Thank you. Uh, I heard uh, a bird told me that there's a couple of books in the works. Well, yes. I mean, everybody says they're going to ultimately write the book, you know, uh, and you usually don't do it till you can't remember it. So I've started. Uh, they're two very distinct books. One of them's uh, You Can't Make Stories Up Like This. I love that title. I just love and that. Based, I can't wait to get that. Oh, uh, yeah. And it's based on real, real. I couldn't have written it before because I would have been liable, but half mm. of the people are gone now. Oh, so that's <laughs> But they're really some funny, funny, funny stories about, you know, some of the celebrities and the very elite uh, part of my interior design experiences that maybe led me to furniture design as an escape. I'm not sure. But they're great stories and they're true stories and they're, 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 they're humorous and it's about design and decorating and furniture. Uh, and then the other one is to market to market. And that one will be about, well, I think I know, but... That's a tr- that's more for our industry, mm-hmm. but it really is about um, the history of marketing and mm-hmm. uh, the integration of merchandising and marketing as a trade book. Which kind of brings this interview full circle because, you know, when you started and we talked at the beginning, you talked about wrapping everything up, I guess we would say, in a nice, neat package. And if you're designing or your merchandising, you have you have the big picture in mind all the way through the process. Or when you get the product done, if you didn't think that way, you might not be able to sell it. Correct. And let's face it, that's what we're all here to do once we put the thing together, correct? That's right. Yeah. Well, thank so, you. Thank you very much for it's being with great. us. It's been great. Thanks for asking me. Take care. I want to thank my guest, Jenna Hall, for taking the time to speak with me today. Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the American Society of Furniture Designers. We're recorded in High Point, North Carolina. To learn more about ASFD, visit asfd.com. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of Design Between the Lines.